היי, אייס דה קורונה סטארטד, אני פייד מייסלף פרפרינג וידאו לקצ'רס אז פארט אוף טיצ'ינג, אווי פרום טיצ'ינג, ואני חשבתי שאולי אני אעשה את זה באנגלית, אולי כמה אנשים יכולים לראות את זה יוסיפול. The thing about uh, the lectures uh, that I'm giving is that the goal is not really to deliver uh, the information because if you are interested, I'm sure you can find a very good book or an excellent paper that will explain it all. And if you're not interested, you probably forget it before the video ends. So what I'll try to do is, uh, that's what I usually try to do in the lectures is to show that uh, there are many hidden assumptions in everything uh, we do almost and it's uh, really a challenge to find them and many times it is hidden in a, a very simple uh, change of variables even so uh, let's see how it goes actually if we are considering uh, assumptions and a, a defined physical narrow picture, Shockley and Kweiser paper is uh, one of the best uh, to touch upon this issue because uh, frankly, it, we all know uh, the Shockley-Kweiser limit extremely well. But let's be honest, how many of us uh, have read it? Or how many of us have read it several times because it has so many levels in it that you really have to read it several times to understand what's going on but it's a, an exceptional uh, paper because everything regarding assumption, assumptions is uh, actually written in the paper including the fact that the title says that they are interested in the pn junction solar cells so don't be surprised if some of the conclusions are not really applicable to single junction uh, PN type cells. And you know, when I was uh, working on this uh, specific slide, I started wondering why am I so obsessed about assumptions and stuff like that. And uh, I figured maybe it has something to do with uh, a personal trauma that I had uh, in the past. <coughs> And uh, back in uh, 96, when I was uh, about eight months into my uh, postdoc uh, period at uh, the Cambridge Labs, I was invited to a conference in uh, Tokyo. And uh, several prominent uh, scientists uh, who were also invited uh, took the, made the effort to say in their lectures that uh, they've heard from a very good uh, friend of theirs who is expert on lasers that uh, the paper that we published uh, in Nature was uh, a big mistake. It, there was no lasing in, in that one. Actually, for the first uh, 12 months uh, following that publication, I think uh, only Alan Higger was uh, willing to openly acknowledge uh, our work. And uh, maybe that's the trauma, but uh, I'll stop whining at this stage and uh, let's uh, move to the physics. So before I uh, going into the physics, uh, let's uh, first look at it from the device point of view. And uh, just remember we are still dealing with an ideal uh, solar cell device. And the idea is that uh, we know how this device behaves. We know it's a transfer function, which means that we know the relation between the current and the voltage. And of course, if we know that, we can also, we all can also derive the reverse uh, relation. And uh, this would often be called uh, the dark uh, characteristics. And then we say that uh, <coughs> if we have a uh, light uh, shining on, on the device, then this light will uh, create uh, an equivalent uh, current source that will uh, flow in this uh, system, which in this case, where well, we have only the current uh, source and the device itself, then it flows in a closed loop and it can uh, create an external voltage. Basically here, we don't connect any 
external uh, load, so this is uh, the open circuit uh, conditions. And in, under these uh, conditions, we can uh, say that uh, the open circuit is, is really uh, as the IV characteristics when the current is the current uh, driven by the sun here. And uh, since uh, when we short uh, circuit uh, these two electrodes, the current flows only through those electrodes and not through the device, we can say that uh, we can replace uh, the sun current with the short circuit uh, current. And of course, if we want to extract some power, then there has to be a load uh, brought into the picture. And this is uh, where it will uh, be positioned. Now uh, let's make a, a very first and basic assumption already appearing in the title of the paper. And we assume that the device we are going to study is a, a PN junction diode. So we really replace this uh, arbitrary device shape with the symbol uh, of a diode. And since it's a diode, we know the characteristics uh, of this diode, the relation between the current and the voltage of an ideal uh, PN diode. And under these circumstances, if we are interested in the open circuit voltage, we can uh, exchange uh, between current and voltage and derive the relation for the open circuit voltage. And we have here the famous relation between the current generated by the sun, the dark leakage current, and of course the room temperature. So uh, we saw what's happening in terms of uh, the device. And uh, now let's see what kind of uh, semiconductor or what kind of uh, physical picture we have uh, in mind. So uh, what we have here is a, a two-level system where there is a band gap. And uh, when uh, light uh, is uh, shining upon this uh, system and uh, if the energy of that light is larger than the band gap, only then there will be some uh, absorption and generation of charges. So this is really an illustration of what uh, might happen when we shine a light pulse. And in this case, the charges are staying on top because we didn't allow for any combination. <clears throat> so the question is uh, what kind of uh, voltage we can expect uh, to derive uh, from uh, this uh, material. And if you look at it, you, you can see that it seems that the electron can lose the energy of the bang up. So probably this is what we can get out of this device. But uh, remember, I used the word device, which means we are going to attach electrodes to this uh, system. And when we attach electrodes, they actually are in equilibrium with the device, which means that these, uh, or quasi-equilibrium with the device, means that these electrodes don't really sense the energy position of individual charges. What they sense is the quasi-Fermi levels. So basically, <clears throat> this is what we are going to extract in terms of voltage, not really the energies that a single electron uh, can release, but rather the energy of the entire system which includes uh, excited and non-excited uh, sites. Or if you are working with molecular semiconductors, some of the molecules are excited and some of them uh, are not. And we, if we want to think of the molecular picture, where well, we have a molecule in the ground state and the excited state, then the, the energy we can uh, extract from an ensemble of molecules, not all of them are at the excited state, would be the chemical uh, potential of the system. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's uh, continue with uh, what we just saw, the very basic uh, absorption event that uh, we saw generated these uh, charges at the top. And of course, if we increase the uh, the light intensity or we shine another pulse, we enhance the charge density. And if we enhance the charge density, we enhance the 
separation between the Fermi levels and the, the distance between the Fermi level and the relevant band become uh, shorter to indicate the fact that we have a, a larger density of uh, carriers. As you can see here again, there is no loss uh, due to recombination, which of course is uh, non-physical because if there was absorption, there, there would be also an, an emission. So basically what we need to do is to think of our semiconductor that uh, there is an absorption, but there could also be some uh, recombination, which will result in uh, spontaneous emission. And you can see that uh, at the end of the day, the density that we will arrive at will be some kind of a, a steady state or equilibrium if the excitation is uh, only due to temperature between the generation and recombination events. In uh, the practical devices, usually besides the absorption and, and spontaneous uh, emission, which are inevitable, there is a, always a, some a kind of non-radiative or extrinsic or parasitic, if you like, channel that uh, adds some combination to the system. And uh, what we can uh, see here that if we have more uh, combination, then of course we'll have less charges in the system and we will lose uh, more in the electrochemical potential. This uh, simple uh, illustration shows us that uh, we really want to have uh, as uh, little as, uh, as possible in terms of uh, extrinsic uh, recombination uh, channels. So we should really, really t turn off all the non-radiative channels. And uh, if you look at uh, this slide and the slide before it, and you listen to what I've said, you probably didn't notice that I've uh, already included the uh, two assumptions in the, these two slides, which, uh, if I remember correctly, they appear in the Shockley paper, and I will uh, let you find them uh, yourselves. So in terms of uh, materials, what we've seen uh, so far is that uh, under a steady state, uh, there would always be excitation uh, and emission events. The energy of the excited uh, states is uh, the energy of uh, the bang up and it serves an upper bound for the open uh, circuit voltage. And we've already seen that due to the presence of uh, radiative recombination, it will never be reached. Since uh, absorption and, and emission are related to each other through uh, thermodynamic uh, considerations, and uh, we are really going to drive this uh, solar cell uh, engine with uh, the energy of the sun, then we can really use uh, some thermodynamic uh, consideration and uh, derive a more uh, realistic uh, bound. And this is really what uh, Shockley's paper uh, is about. And I truly recommend uh, reading it. And if you've noticed, uh, you should do it more than once. Actually, the, the two very good uh, old papers are shown here. The first one is the one we are focusing on, which is uh, the famous uh, Shockley Quasar paper. But there are also another paper which is not so known, which looks at uh, the problem from uh, the chemistry or molecular uh, point of view. And it's really very good and uh, very useful. And actually just uh, a general comment that I've noticed over the year that many of the really good physics and the useful uh, physics papers the authors uh, tend to have the affiliation of chemistry. And uh, if you don't really like reading old papers because the language is not uh, always uh, the same as we use today, then there is a series of a uh, paper by uh, Rao that uh, look at uh, these issues with uh, a modern outlook and uh, even some uh, more directed towards uh, organic or unique materials that are being uh, used uh, these days. So uh, we've understood the, the basics uh, behind the, the physical picture that is going to be used in the paper. 
and uh, we would like also to see how we can uh, derive some uh, equations and we'll stay on the rate equation uh, level and uh, really what we say that uh, what we've seen so far is that we are generating pairs and we are losing pairs due to recombination so we can write a, a really simple uh, rate equation where the rate of change in the density of uh, electron hole pairs is uh, going up with uh, light uh, generating uh, pairs and it's going down as we have recombination with uh, a given uh, lifetime. As I said before, we are typically interested in the steady state so we can really nullify uh, the left uh, side of the equation and we can see that uh, the charge density of the pairs is indeed uh, an equilibrium or steady state between the excitation and the recombination events. And uh, if we are discussing an uh, ideal device, then uh, this lifetime is uh, dictated only by uh, radiative uh, emission events. The next thing we would usually do is uh, we assume that we know the density of states of the system and uh, at, at first we think of the density of states of uh, electron hole pairs and if you are in a molecular system you would think of uh, the density of states for the excitons and uh, we think that uh, the semiconductor is uh, non-degenerate so we can uh, use the Boltzmann approximation and uh, we can really link the charge density, the density of states and the electrochemical uh, potential through the band gap. And from this we can really derive the electrochemical potential which uh, would be the maximum we can expect uh, to get from, from this device which is uh, the band gap minus the the log of, of, of this function which we have here is the density of states and the density of uh, charges that we actually calculated in this uh, figure <coughs> sorry shows again that uh, we have this uh, balance between generation and recombination on a different note is that uh, in many papers or in some papers when you we think of uh, gen semiconductors you'll see and equations which look a little bit different and the way to link them is to realize that if electron and holes are free and pairs are combination of the two then these are the relation between the pairs and the number of pairs that we generate or the density of pairs that we can expect to have in a system but if we go back to our ideality issues then uh, the next uh, ideality that was introduced in this figure was the fact that we are using the Boltzmann approximation which means that uh, we assume that the device never enters the non-degenerate regime and that the excitation is not uh, very large. We found the, the expression uh, noted here that is uh, really showing us uh, what you should expect with respect to the band gap and, uh, and as we said in the ideal case the only loss is uh, because uh, we have a finite excitation i and there is always a recombination tau which uh, as we said in the ideal case it's dictated only by a radiated recombination as uh, the, the if it includes also temperature you can also say that you know if you let the solar cell heat more that's also a problem what we can see also find also in the Shockley's paper is that uh, in uh, some sense he's aiming at what we would call uh, these days uh, managing expectations and uh, really to decide if uh, your cell is good enough or there is room for improvement you really need uh, to know uh, what what to expect out of it and uh, as uh, always it uh, depends on uh, your expectation the higher the expectations 
the bigger the challenge is. So uh, let's see what are the expectations or the extremely ideal case as outlined in the shock requisar paper. And uh, let's go through them. So let's uh, first look on, on the bright side that uh, we can gain uh, or create solar cells that will have uh, more efficiency than uh, the ones described by the paper. And uh, we simply need uh, to look at uh, the assumptions, uh, for example, with respect to the materials that uh, he, in this paper he considers only single photon absorption. So there is no two photon absorption and also there is a, every photon uh, produces only one electron hole pair. And uh, with respect to the issue of uh, equilibrium and uh, the electrochemical potential in relation to charge density, there is the assumption that there is a relaxation and there is no such thing like uh, hot carriers that carry more energy. And indeed, we can find the materials that are efficient at uh, two photon absorption, so they will uh, absorb subgap uh, photons. Or there are also materials that uh, if you absorb uh, a photon with an energy which is uh, twice or more of the band gap, they will produce uh, two electron hole pairs. And this would look like a breaking a efficiency limit. And the same thing is about uh, hot carriers. But uh, these things look exotic, but there are other ways that you could uh, break if you like. And uh, for some reason, people don't refer to it as breaking the limit, is that you can uh, use multi-junctions, as many people do these days, and you break the limit for a single junction. And uh, basically, all these uh, exotic uh, material uh, approaches that could uh, lead us to some gain can be realized with uh, smart device engineering. And history tells us that uh, device engineering usually is uh, easier than finding an exotic material that uh, will make it to the device at the end. But there's not only to be gained. Usually we discuss uh, what we are doing. <clears throat> and again, uh, we look at, uh, at the expression, and here we look at the I and tau. And the important thing first is what do we expect out of the sun? How much light are we supposed to get into our uh, device? And uh, the paper starts by taking the ideal uh, uh, case where the sun and the the solar cell are a closed uh, system where all the uh, photons uh, that are emitted by the sun are absorbed by uh, the solar cells and vice versa. And also that every photon that is being absorbed is uh, directly converted to free uh, electron and hole charges. On the lifetime uh, side, the assumption is that there are only radiative uh, combination, which is the emission that is associated directly with the absorption through the Einstein A and B coefficients. And as we've uh, touched before, we know that uh, not all uh, photons emitted by the sun are absorbed by a solar cell, thankfully we should say. And uh, also not all photons that are absorbed in uh, the material will uh, convert uh, to free charges. And there are many different uh, mechanisms that could uh, prevent uh, the, from this to happen. And uh, on the blue side, there is also the charge recombination uh, through traps or any other uh, impurity or non-ideality in, in the material. And these are always uh, on top of the radiative uh, emission. So there are extra losses. And uh, the biggest problem is usually is how to quantify these losses. <coughs> there are also losses that uh, sometimes uh, we find them uh, as if they are surprising. Zero resistance, which we've already seen in uh, 
the equivalent circuit could be actually embedded within the device because we have uh, materials with uh, low mobility. And uh, also, believe it or not, sometimes part of the losses is because it's very difficult to decide where is really the band gap. So what is the reference? And uh, beyond that, uh, if we are uh, discussing uh, new materials, it's also very difficult to know what is the density of states in these materials. So really what to plug into this uh, equation of if EG or ND is unknown. So I just to illustrate, illustrate the idea of uh, not knowing uh, the relevant bang up, I brought here uh, the absorption and emission spectrum of uh, an organic material, PPV actually. And if you are not from uh, the field of organic materials, you would say, wow, what is this uh, strange uh, huge shift between the absorption and emission? What energy do we need to consider the absorption, the emission? But if you are from uh, the field, you know that there are many, or at least more than one, rigorous uh, method that allows us to take uh, the absorption and derive uh, the absorption edge in a way that you can derive it uh, rigorously for uh, many different uh, materials. But the question is, is this uh, way of deriving the absorption edge suitable for the equations and assumptions we made when we built uh, the model above? And surprise, surprise, reality says that uh, most of them, maybe even all of them, and we're not designed for that. By now, we have uh, already touched a uh, few examples about uh, what it means, uh, a difference between uh, expectations and uh, practice. And part of uh, managing the expectations, uh, you can find in the paper a discussion that uh, involves a thermal uh, engine, a closed system, and, and entropy. And if in, you never went through those uh, courses or opened uh, those books, it sounds uh, a bit frightening. So I try to put it in uh, simple words. And uh, the idea of uh, the highest uh, level of expectation is that uh, the sun and the, your device would be a closed system. It means that, uh, let's say that when there is fair play, all the photons that are emitted by the sun are collected by the device and vice versa. All the photons uh, uh, emitted by the device are collected by the sun. But uh, in practice, uh, to be fair, the device should have uh, been emitting only towards the sun because that's the solid angle where it's getting the energy from. Uh, but in practice, the device is emitting uh, in all uh, angles so basically, this uh, difference in uh, expectations in solid angles says that we are, our device is really emitting much more than it should have if it would have been a fair play. You can also think of it in another way that uh, what's wrong with this uh, picture is the sun is only located at a certain uh, place and it's not really surrounding Earth by uh, or your surrounding actually your device uh, completely and this of course uh, relative ratio is a uh, is a loss mechanism and uh, if you put this ratio into the same expression that we got before we see that we lose compared to what you would have expected something like 0.3 ev if you use a, a device which has a, a back mirror you practically force the device to emit only to half of the sphere. So you actually improve uh, the relations between your device and the sun. And you can gain, you know, a little bit, but uh, sometimes this uh, small number uh, can uh, be translated into a lot of dollars. So basically this issue of uh, fair play, angles, etc., that's a... Uh, really what uh, the end uh, point of the closed uh, system and uh, an entropy in, uh, in our context. 
The other way that we can uh, lose uh, in that respect is that uh, we assume that everything that uh, arrives uh, at the surface of the device really goes in. But uh, unfortunately, our device is made of a material which is uh, not air. Namely, it has a different refractive index, so the, it's very likely that when uh, light comes through the air and it impinges, impinges on our devices, there would be reflection. So only a part of the light is really being absorbed uh, in the device. And as before, if you want to know what's the uh, voltage loss in terms of uh, open circuit voltage, you plug in the ratio of, uh, of loss and uh, you get how much you lost in terms of uh, open circuit voltage. The same goes for uh, radiative and non-radiative combination. And uh, the idea is that uh, what we need uh, now to do is to see how the fact that we have uh, an extra channel of our combination, this non-radiative part, really affects uh, the open circuit voltage, but by changing the radiative uh, rate to a certain ratio. So what we do, we simply uh, make a change of uh, terms. We replace tau by tau times eta, and we define eta through this uh, term, which mathematically holds. But uh, in practice, you can also see that what it means, it is the radiative uh, quantum efficiency. Because this is the radiative rate, and this is the non-radiative rate. And it, it approaches one when the non-radiative rate goes to zero, or the tau of it goes to infinity. And uh, indeed, if you wanted to see what, uh, how much you lose uh, when the device is not uh, so efficient, this is the term as before that uh, states the amount of voltage loss. And, and, and really this is uh, one of the reasons that it became uh, more evident in uh, recent years that uh, if you want uh, to make a, a good solar cell, you'd better use uh, materials that uh, have a, a very good uh, luminescence efficiency. Why Shockley published it in the 1960s and only in recent years it's become uh, widely sought for by our community, that's uh, beyond my expertise. <clears throat> but uh, one thing uh, I think we all uh, learned that uh, generating charges through total uh, luminescence quenching has used to be the goal uh, for quite a few years in our field is really not a good way to go because you inherently lose a, a lot of voltage. Although in some materials we had to do that because otherwise you would have lost the, the current and if you want some efficiency, you need to find a trade-off. But as a rule, this was not a good rule. So now we've uh, finished uh, the physics part of uh, this talk or uh, some of the physics that is relevant. Uh, actually, the previous slides, all they were meant for is to help you uh, when you read for the first time uh, the Shockley-Quizer paper or the other papers I mentioned uh, on the topic. Simply, it took me three to four times uh, to get somewhere with them, so I only showed you what I thought was uh, in my way at the beginning, but you might find other obstacles. Who knows? But uh, good luck. So back to the equivalent circuits that uh, I promise we'll finish with. So again, we have the ideal PN diode. This is the ideal uh, JV curve and the equivalent uh, circuit. The next thing uh, we do is we want to add a light uh, to the equation. So we know that the sun would uh, act as an equivalent uh, current source where charges are being separated and driven to their respective contacts. And this is uh, the equivalent circuit of uh, an ideal uh, diode. If we look at uh, this circuit, 
we know that uh, the sun has to enter here with a, a negative sign. If we again look at uh, the circuit, we see that uh, based on this circuit, we can uh, exchange uh, the sun current with the short circuit current, and uh, we end up with a very famous uh, equation describing the operation of a PN diode uh, solar cell. And uh, what it does, uh, the introduction of, uh, of light, is shift uh, the curve uh, downwards. We, here we have the short circuit current at V equals zero, and this would be the open circuit voltage when there is no current flowing. And somewhere on the way here in the slide, there is a hidden assumption. Uh, you're almost welcome to find it. So that was uh, the equivalent uh, circuit of uh, an ideal diode, but life uh, are seldom uh, ideal. And basically, every solar cell has uh, some form of uh, serial resistance or parallel resistance in the equivalent uh, circuit. The physical meaning of these two may vary. The most uh, common uh, one or the most physical one would be that the uh, parallel uh, resistance that uh, makes us lose current because current flowing out part of it we would drain through it. This would represent uh, recombination uh, channels or non-radiative recombination channels and the CR resistance is standing in a way of uh, extracting the current so this would be real resistances usually either at the contacts or through the bulk when we have a low mobility semiconductor. The effect of uh, having these two resistances uh, in the equivalent circuit on the function of uh, the cell or the JV is shown here. On the left is the effect of the parallel resistance and on the right is the effect of uh, the serial resistance. And we can see that the serial resistance can really reduce the maximum power we can extract from the cell. But uh, it doesn't uh, do anything to the open circuit voltage, simply because uh, when the circuit is open, there is no current flowing through the serial resistance, so it can't have any effect on uh, what we measure. So the voltage is the same voltage. In a similar way, the effect of the parallel resistance uh, disappears when we are at a short circuit. And this is uh, the last uh, slide of uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, just uh, some food for thought, uh, as the slide says. You, you typically, the devices are complicated. It's not just one layer. We have uh, several layers or if we have a, a resistance, it is uh, evolving across a, a full layer and not just across the interface. And sometimes the real picture to describe what's going on within the device is not to use a lumped uh, element, but rather to think of it as a distributed system where parallel and serial resistances are connected in series like layer after layer after layer. And this uh, naturally will have uh, an effect on uh, the output characteristics of the cells that would uh, now change uh, in a similar way, but not identical. There will be noticeable differences to what uh, I showed in the previous slide. And uh, if you think of it a little bit, uh, you'll find some uh, things that uh, in some papers they are considered as uh, surprises. So very likely you'll be surprised as well. So I hope uh, you enjoyed the, the movie and uh, have a good time uh, in the sun. Bye.